Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Um, now for Off the Press, let's introduce our guest, Mr. G.D. Johnson. He's a chief lecturer at the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. Fantastic. On the Daily Sun newspaper, the headline reads, Outrage over plan to turban Sultan of Shua Arab of Edo State. Government kicks, says, move sacrilegious threats to peace and security. EFCC stops ex-Abia governor T.A. Orji from traveling abroad. Antigraft agency quizzes ex-governor's son. Commission spokesman says he was arrested. Ghani's son, Mohammed, died of COVID-19-related complications. That's according to the family. PIA, Ijo Youth Spitfire, declare President Silver persona non grata in Niger Delta. Anambra Guba, PDP candidates missing as INEC releases list. Fixes September 7 for final list. Okonkwa not afraid of opponents in the Zenith Labour Party. Security, Buhari talks tough in meeting with security service chiefs. Threatens to make more changes. Vows not to leave office a failure. Defense democracy, Achiku, fire me others, urge Nigerians. Ex-Vice President says restructuring will foster sense of nationhood. Ekiti State Governor says we should focus on how to reinvent our nation. PSC waits for Abakari reports, sets up in-house panel. Lastly on the Daily Sun, WK signs open grazing prohibition, VAT collection laws. All right, and now to the Punch newspapers. PDP peace pact crumbles. Abasanjo Secundus in closed door meeting. WK's group kicks as Secundus plans October National Convention shift. Fresh NAC meeting may hold, and also NWC members disagree of a zoning panel. Buhari approves 368 grazing sites in 25 states, and also the Naira sinks to 520 uh, Naira to a dollar as foreign reserves slide further. Still on the punch, Buni Batu's five suits, 100 APC members seek removal. Uh, airport concession will fail, legal tussle imminent, says Labour. Still on the punch this morning, IOCs owe NDDC $4 billion. Agency debt to contractors now 3 trillion naira, says the federal government. Buhari's security strategy is working. He won't leave office a failure, says the NSA. And uh, 55 billion naira fraud, EFCC quizzes uh, ex-Abia Governor Orji and Son for 10 hours. Southwest kidnap victims paid 3 billion naira in two years says Ghani Adams. Still on the punch this morning, policeman, uh, policemen rather, detain and enslave ESN member's girlfriend. IG orders probe. Hoodlums rob POS operator of 4 million naira, burn cops, uh, cops kill Uber driver. And finally, anger in Edo over Sultan of Shua Arab's planned installation. Let's take a look at the Guardian newspaper to see what's making headlines. Federal character, gender gap, dog PIA, as federal government inaugurates committee. NNPC to eliminate loss-making subsidiaries under new legislation. Niger Delta Military six control of 3% for host communities. PIA has shortchanged Cross River, Ayade cries out. Host communities deserve 5%, that's according to OB. Governors will work with PIA implementation committees, according to FIME. Court rejects application to stop Kiari's arrest, extradition. INEC lists Soludo despite court's affirmation of Umoji Abgas faction. Watertight security as Buhari visits Adamawa today. Council chairman give immigration 24 hours to vacate Oyo. President tells service chiefs, I am not ready to leave office a failure. And the story we saw then on the Daily Sun, Wiki signs open grazing prohibition bill, VAT collection bill, others into law. On the nation... Insecurity, Buhari threatens removal of military chiefs. I won't leave Nigeria in security crisis. Obasanjo says, situation bad but redeemable. And uh, we are winning terror war, says minister. Amoteko arrest underage herders, seizes 49 cows in Ondo. And also banks, forex dealings on the close uh, EFCC watch. A few others uh, on the nation. COVID-19 cases rise by 97% in three days. 
President OK's review of grazing reserves in 25 states and police arrest 889 crime suspects in Lagos. IOC's owing NDDC $4 billion, says Niger Delta Minister. Julia Johnson, good morning once again. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to, to, to be with you. To right. be with you. Um, let's start with the story of um, the plan installation of the Sultan of Pure of Arabedu by some, some elements in, in a do state. I, I've gone through the story. The governor, each state has its own chief council law. That's why it was possible for the governor of Kano State to remove the former sultan of Shokoto. And that's why it was possible for him to 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 bacchanize the to remove the emir of Shokoto rather. That's why it was easy for him to bacchanize the emirate by creating five emirates out of the existing Kanu emirate that has existed for over for over a century. So nobody could appoint a king or a traditional ruler without going through the traditional uh, rules based on the on the laws of each of the states. So the Edo state government, has, they are not aware. The people are not aware. The uh, is an expansionist agenda, and if this issue is not dealt with, we begin to have problem in this in this country. That takes me to the story of why some people are saying that they are not interested in giving their lands um, for grazing for for grazing. That in the next hundred years, if you give land to people to to, to graze in their community. They claim to be indigenous of that, of those of those communities. That's why the Lagos um, Ogun State, Oshun State, Equity State, and now River State have passed the anti grazing have passed the anti grazing bill, while the president has approved 25 grazing sites in 25 states. The president is much more concerned about grazing than is much more concerned about security. Uh, that, that is much more concerned about other other issues, other, other infrastructural development. I don't know um, how uh, the focus will be on installation of an number, on the focus will be on having grazing site in 25 in 25 in 25 states of the federation. I think those that are involved should be should be prosecuted for breaking the law. The the the, the, the unfortunate thing is that. Um, People break the law willingly, and there are no consequences for actions or inactions by people in, in, in authority. I hope the plan, um, we should respect our institution, even though I am of the opinion that we need to cancel all traditional, traditional institutions if you really want to practice um, federalism and republicanism. Republicanism is antithetical to, to, to traditional institutions. It means that the people... The power belongs to the people. Nobody has power by right. Uh, republicanism came from, from the French Revolution, where by the royalty was condemned to the doldrums of history, and the power belongs to the republic. The republic means the people. That means government of people. But here you have Federal Republic of Nigeria, and then you have a traditional institution being part and parcel of that. It's everything in Nigeria is an anomaly. We practice federalism on paper, but in principle, we practice unitarism. Uh, we say we are a Republican state, yet we have structures for traditional rulers in our local government. They collect five percent of the whatever revenue that goes to. So it's it's, it's unfortunate. You you can't you can't have two heads. One is facing forward and one is facing backward. That's the contraption which we have when it comes to principle of governance, style of governance in Nigeria. So Nigeria has two heads. One is facing forward. One is facing backward. We don't know whether we are moving forward. And we don't know whether we are moving backward. God will help us out um, yeah. in, in, right. this, in this regard. John, J.D. Johnson, also speak on the um, statement by the NSA saying uh, President Mohamed Buhari's security strategies are working. And the president also saying that how, he wouldn't How, leave, how uh, would you give an exam to a student uh, and the student to examine himself and the student to score himself? If you do that, what do you think every student would do? If you give an exam to a student and you give the power of evaluation, and the grading to the student. If you see the way other newspaper framed it, what the president said, the president said, I won't be a failure. He threatens to fire the service chief. Then the national security advisor that should, that should have been fired in the first instance, he's saying that uh, they are passing. Which pass mark? Can he 
safely and conveniently travel to any part in Nigeria without security being provided, adequate security. You read the story that the president is going to Adamawa. Adamawa has been turned to a fortress. It's there in the newspaper. It's not J.D. Johnson that wrote the story. It's not J.D. Johnson that mobilized the security agencies. It is those that are, in, that are controlling the security apparatus of the country that have taken it upon themselves to ensure that Adamawa, uh, Adamawa becomes a fortress. So he is saying that they, they, they have been, he's, he's trying to justify his, his continued occupation of that office in which he has failed. He should have gone with other service chiefs when those other service chiefs were, 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 were fired. So uh, with security, is there. It's, it's, every time we open the pages of newspaper, what do we read? The issue of insecurity, left hand and center, challenges here and there. And then you have a situation whereby you have the military will say, okay, some people have repented. They integrate them back into the military. How do you fight security like that? I remember when ISIS was a major thing and some said, okay, um, the, the, the members of ISIS were declared as, as personal non grata and that there was no nation that was interested in taking back their citizen because they don't, they've been declared a terrorist group. And that's one of the reasons why we said federal government refused to declare um, Boko Haram terrorist group because if you declare them terrorist group, nobody will be able to take them. They are citizens of no country. But we, we know, and that's why you could have people repenting after killing and maiming people with their repentance, bring up people from the dead. The National Security Advisor can say whatever he wants to say. But the evidence is on ground. Are, are, are contrary to what he is saying. So it's only fools that argue with proofs. The proofs and the evidences that are on ground shows that there are serious security challenges that we are having in Nigeria. And that's why Abbas just said, well, it's mounting, but we can win the war. It's improving. Nobody wants us to have security challenges. I want to travel to my Duguri. I want to go to Shukoto. I want to go to, if you read this book we read in secondary school, Mr. Mr. Giwa is a trader. He tells you about how peaceful the whole of Nigeria is and how he used to travel throughout the length and breadth of Nigeria. Everybody wants to travel through that. My parents travel throughout Nigeria. People used to travel throughout Nigeria in a day they will pack, they will stop and eat and then they will go. My wife used to attend Federal uh, Guest College in Bida and the parents will leave Lagos and go to Bida to go and check on her. Nobody can do that today. Mr. Jide Johnson, let's um, take a look at two stories, you know, in, in the political space. Um, the first one here on the punch says that the PDP peace pact crumbles, um, talks about how um, the WK group is kicking against the Secondus uh, plan for an October national convention. Also, in the ruling APC, um, there are five suits against Buni and 100 PDP members that are seeking his removal still over the chairmanship issue. We are not seeing the end of the crisis. We are just seeing the beginning of the crisis. One, um, let's talk about the PDP own. I don't know why people are always in a hurry. You have a timeline and a time span for the expiration of the tenor of, of your national chairman. You live with it. And when the time comes, you do your national convention and you remove your national chairman. Now, if, um, and if he succeeds, uh, Hello. Jide Johnson, let me just quickly uh, point out. It says WK's group kicks against Secondo's plan for October National Convention shift. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Why? Why is his tenure was cut short by two or three months? That's that's probably the guy wants to leave his tenure. That's that's the reason. For me, I think that what PDP should do is to is to what the parties, not even PDP, what the parties should do is to stick with their constitution. Whatever their constitution says should be the guiding principle. That's one of the fundamentals of democratic society is the supremacy of the constitution. If parties cannot respect their own constitution, how would they respect the constitution of Nigeria? That's why you see governors act with impunity, president acts with impunity, because from the party they come from, they don't have respect for their own laws, extant laws that establish them. So they should have respect for it. If you have respect for your laws, for your constitution, there won't be crisis. There won't be crisis. The one you are talking about in NAPC is because you have an aberration. The one you are having in PDP is because the wicked group wants to remove the wicked group in the first instance that installed secundus. Because without wicked support, secundus wouldn't have become the national chairman of PDP. So the wicked group now 
wants to remove secondos without sticking to the constitution of the party, why secondos himself is running the party without sticking to the constitution of the party? So you have groups of lawless people managing the party system and they will select candidates to run on their party platform and Nigerians being gullible as we are, we elect either one of these lawless people selected by lawless party members to be the people that will run our administration. So we have people that have no respect for law and then we'll be crying. Like I told you, I gave an illustration. Nigeria is like a country that has two eggs. One is facing front, one is facing back. And that's the situation you have in both political parties. And how about for the APC? It's the same thing as what you have in both political parties. Both parties don't have respect for their laws. They don't have respect. They don't have respect for their laws. And that's why you are, you are seeing that the parties be devil with crisis. Hmm. You, you see the parties are moving from one crisis to another. It's from one crisis to another. Look, I was um, Oyegun removed. I was Adam Soshomale removed. Now, now we have Buni. Buni. Let me tell you, for example, there is a common principle that says that if the president is from the north, the national chairman of the party will be from the south. Is that the arrangement you have in APC? Hmm. All right. Now you remove, you remove, you remove Adam Soshomale from a door. You replace Adam Soshomale with, um, with, with, with someone from UB. The president is from the north. The, the acting national chairman of the party is from the north. Which takes me to the story of the, 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 the membership of the steering committee of the Petroleum Industrial Act that people are complaining about that has made uh, neither the other people to declare to me a personal non grata. 80% of that membership is from the north. And it's about Petroleum Industrial Act, the steering committee, 80%. And you know why? Because by that act, there are some certain people that should be in, the, in that steering committee. And by structure, because you don't respect federal character principle, the mini, li, listen to this, the NNPC chairman is from the north. His state does not produce petroleum product. The executive, uh, the chief executive of the NNPC, his state does not produce petroleum product. In natural sense, the last three NNPC chairman, their state does not produce petroleum product. The permanent secretary of Ministry of Petroleum is from the north. The permanent secretary of the Ministry of Finance, that a member of that standing committee is from the north. So you look at the structure, the president of the uh, Ministry of Petroleum is from the north. So you look at the structure. When people talk about, <coughs> about restructuring, these are the, there's nothing you can do to stop this people from being the membership of the standing committee. However, because the way you have a culture of impunity, a culture that has no respect for federal character, so when you have that culture, a co that culture will supersede structure. And a situation where that culture supersedes structure, you have the confusion you are having now. You have the confusion you are having now. Okay, so I want us to talk about um, the story. It says, um, Southwest kidnap victims pay three billion naira in two years. And that is from Ghani Adams. Well, um, it's it, it just... Kidnapping has turned to a business. You have a situation whereby people are kidnapping Kaduna State. And they demanded for rice. They demanded to feed the kids. They demanded for motorcycles. And the parents paid over 100 million. Parents and victims and families of victims have resort to soft self help to address this particular situation. So it's a big business. Nobody is holding anybody accountable. Nobody that have been made. We have seen technicality stopping the prosecution of, of them. I begin to tell you about top flight cases that have been reported in the media. And there is nothing that we have we have, we have to show for it. Um, uh, Evans case is still hanging. Uh, the case of Wadume that we lost that some police officers were killed. Um, is still hanging. We have not had anything concerning that issue. So where where there are no uh, consequences for action, that's what you have. Everybody okay. Is left on it.
Talking about consequences for action, um, Mr. Jide Johnson, there's a story we've seen um, also on the Punch newspaper that the EFCC has arrested the former Abia State Governor, um, Theodore Oji, and uh, he was apprehended at the airport in Abuja, and his son turned himself in when he learned of his father's arrest. Now, the EFCC says that the ex-governor allegedly collected 500 million naira monthly for eight years as um, for security votes when he was governor of Abia State from 2007 and 2015. Allegations you know, also say that he mismanaged the sum of 2 billion naira for ecological fund and conversion of Shopee funds. So, um, step in the right direction. Or do you think he would well, also uh, be let off the hook later on? Uh, well, uh, we know we, 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 we inherited some, we inherited a monster for military administration. Which is the security vote? There's nothing like there's nothing in the in in, in the constitution that says that governor have right to security vote, and that's a vote nobody can investigate. And how can governors be spending money on security votes and it's not it's not under scrutiny? It cannot be audited. Well, I hope if EFCC succeed in this, it serves as a case precedent with respect to looking at how governors are spending security votes. Can you imagine somebody collecting 500 million monthly? 500 million monthly. For now, if years. Abia is collecting, if the governor of Abia is collecting 500 million, how much is the governor of Lagos State collecting? How much are other governors collecting? Who is investigating those ones that are there? What steps, what instruments have we put in place to stop that culture, that culture of collecting that money, so that you put structure in place to? To affect that structure. Yeah, but how, how do you think they can? How do you think they can? You know, create uh, make a case out of this because governors are like you said. Governors are still collecting security vote. They've been collecting yes, since, since you know. So, so, so probably if, if if it's prosecuted on this matter, it becomes it becomes a case precedent that will make me to also ask questions about how security votes are being spent in my state. For you to do that in your state to use the Freedom of Information Act and deploy that for governors to explain, you should be able to explain. How you have money you are spending on security. Even the United States of America told us how much they've spent. They spent in Afghanistan. They've told us. They, but only in Nigeria they tell you don't know anything about security. And then what is security vote? How will government justify collecting security votes? And then we have the spate of insecurity we have. Can you imagine 500 million monthly? All right. Jenny Johnson, finally, I want us to um, wrap up with, with this. I want us to go back to. Uh, the statement from the president in the paper saying that um, you know he's uh, he, he would not leave uh, government a failure. Um, I want you to quickly share your thoughts on you know the legacy of the current administration. If there's time between now and 2023 to put forward a, gr a good legacy, uh, do you think that they currently have a very very interesting one? And is there enough time to change it? If no, if not, when you treat criminals with kick gloves. When you treat lawbreakers with kick gloves, when you say people are repenting, you put them back in, you see, just go and check the consistent inconsistency of government statement when it comes to repentant Boko Haram. And what the governor of Bono State said in the past, what he's saying presently, what God, federal government has said in the past, and what they are saying presently, history is what put everybody in the rightful place they belong. You use your second term to establish a legacy. And I think one of the things that will characterize this administration, like the president said, is how the issue of insecurity is dealt with. You know, one of the reasons why he was elected in 2015 was that he's a former military head of state. He knows what it takes to deal with this issue of security challenges that we have. Five years down the line, we are seeing where we are. By the end of eight years, the scorecard will be out. Time is still on his side for him to, 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 to be decisive and to correct the wrongs of what people have perceived. Perception is stronger than reality. As far as he's concerned, the records might even be there. It's just the general perception of the people and the general perception of how is government managing that perception? How is government managing the information? How is government doing counter policies to fighting insecurity? On one hand, you want to fight insecurity. On the other hand, you are approving 25 grazing sites in Nigeria. You, so when you see uh, conflicting policies that affect your security, peace, and tranquility in your nation, then 
uh, you are setting the you are setting the pace for your record. So history will put him in the rightful place. It's not for me to decide. At the end of his administration, we go through his administration, we go through his course card, and wherever he belongs in history, history will place him there. But the thing is that he only have he only has this second opportunity. Some of them are fortunate to have second opportunity to rule this country. Like Obasanjo, Obasanjo had that opportunity to he's having his own regrets. What he needed to do that he didn't do, what he had opportunity to do that he didn't that he didn't do, and those things he did, they are there. His scorecard, there's nothing he can do to change his scorecard. So the only time Buhari can change his own scorecard is when he's here now. After he's gone, history will help him to place him where he belongs. Okay, right. Mr. Gide Johnson. We thank you very much, as always, for um, showing up on Off the Press on Fridays. Um, do have a great day. It's a pleasure to, to, to be with you, Anita, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, have a wonderful weekend. You too, sir. You too. All right, stay with us. Uh, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, we're going back in history uh, mm -hmm. to share with you things that happened today. Um, I'm talking about the NFL, you know, and uh, the founding of the NFL in 1920. Hmm. And I'm going back to 1989 to talk about a very strange story. Two brothers murdering their parents. We'll be back.